Okay, now we're going to look at uh, topic one, DNA and RNA. This is the information on the syllabus. Okay, this is what we're going to cover. That page and that page. And as we're going through the slides, the bit of the syllabus that I'm covering is on the top of each slide. Okay. Now we need to understand uh, basically two words here, diversity and a species. So the word bi biodiversity is the variety of life that exists. A species is uh, a group of organisms that are going to have something in common, but the most important thing is they can interbreed with each other and produce fertile offspring so that the young that they produce will themselves be capable of reproduction. Cats and dogs are obviously different species because they can't breed with each other. Now, there are exceptions in closely related species. For example, lions and tigers, they're different species, um, but they can breed together in certain circumstances. A, li a, a liger and a tigon are examples. A tigon, for example, is a cross between a male tiger and a female lion. But it's significant that a tigon is not a new species because a tigon is infertile itself. So to recap their definition, you should know as a species is a group of organisms capable of interbreeding to produce fertile offspring. Now we want to look at the phrases heredity, gene expression, and the role of a gene. Heredity is a passing on of characteristics and traits from one generation to the next. It's inheriting uh, the things that make us different, like hair color and eye color, and it's also inheriting the things that make us uniquely human, uh, uh, having uh, two eyes and two arms, etc. Gene expression is the production of a particular protein using the genetic code, and that protein is what causes the physical trait or the characteristic. So gene expression is the production of a protein that causes a particular trait. So a gene causes a particular eye color. How does it do that? It, a gene causes the production of a protein and that protein produces the eye color. Okay, another way of saying that is that a gene is a section of DNA that carries a code for the formation of a particular protein. So that little phrase there is quite important. A section of DNA that carries a code for the formation of a particular protein. Uh, two examples here, the gene for eye color, Okay, it's responsible for production of a particular protein called melanin, and it's melanin that actually gives you uh, the color in your eye. Somebody with brown eyes would have a lot of melanin in their iris. Another example, the gene responsible for producing hemoglobin is known as the hemoglobin beta gene. Okay, it uh, is responsible for forming the molecule hemoglobin for carrying oxygen. Sickle cell anemia is a disorder caused when a, a, a fault develops in that gene. So it, it ends up producing a, a faulty protein. And that can mean a person is not able to uh, efficiently carry oxygen. So sickle cell anemia is an example here of a gene mutation. It's a single fault. Uh, it's a fault by, caused by a single gene. Now, remember on the structure of a chromosome. So a chromosome is a thread-like structure found in the nucleus of a cell. It's also found in the mitochondria of cells and found in the chloroplast of plant cells. Chromosomes themselves are made up of DNA and protein. The protein doesn't carry any genetic information. The protein is there to uh, help tightly uh, wrap or coil the DNA. Okay, so we have chromosome here, which uh, has this X shape because it's just about to divide. And it's tightly coiled, super coiling into, so there's little proteins here, it's wrapped around the protein structures. Okay, and this is your uh, double helix strand of DNA. Okay, and as we, we look at that further, as we said, DNA is found in the nucleus of all cells, it's found in the chloroplast of plant cells, and it's found in the mitochondria of all cells. DNA contains the instructions needed to make protein that control your uh, inherited traits. So this is called the genetic code, your genotype or your genetic code. DNA 
although it's a quite a complex molecule, it's only made up of three parts. Okay, it has a phosphate group, uh, a sugar called a deoxyribose sugar, and a type of molecule called a base. So this a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. So this structure here is called a nucleotide. A nucleotide has a sugar, phosphate, and base. So a DNA molecule is a long strand of these nucleotides connected together. And what makes one nucleotide different from the next is the base. We can have different bases. Okay, here's an example of the beginnings of a strand. So there's a little nucleotide with the sugar, the phosphate, and the base. And down here, the repeating sugar, phosphate base, sugar, phosphate base. There are four types of bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. So the A, T, G, and C. This forms a, a double strand like this, almost like a ladder. And bases form complementary pairs. That C always combines with G. G with C. And A always combines with T. Adenine always combines with thymine. And guanine always combines with cytosine. So they're complementary or matching to each other. The type of bonding between them is called hydrogen bonding. Okay. The DNA molecule is arranged in uh, a double helix shape, almost like a spiral staircase. So we have the sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate going down the side. Okay, And then the bases going across are made up of complementary strands, complementary pairs of adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. So this, this, the, the code is actually located in the sequence of base pairs in the DNA molecule. Okay, the, so genetic code is a sequence of different bases in genes. So the genetic code is a sequence of different bases in the gene. Okay, so the all the different bases. Now we're looking at coding and non-coding. DNA that codes for protein is, is known as coding DNA. Okay? And DNA that doesn't code for protein, sometimes it would be called junk DNA, is non-coding. So this, this represents a long, long strand of DNA. Actually, a lot of the DNA doesn't appear to do anything. It's known as non-coding DNA. And this could be uh, as high as 95, 97% of your DNA doesn't do anything. It's non-coding. Now, also, anyone doing higher level, we should look at classifying bases as being either pyrimidines or purines. Adenine and guanine are the two purine bases. They're double ring molecules. Remember a phrase, pure is gold. Uh, that purine and then we have pure, pure purine and then adenine and, as, and guanine for gold. So adenine and guanine are pure as gold. Cytosine and thymine are the two pyrimidine bases. They're single ring molecules. Okay, now quickly to look at RNA. RNA is a similar molecule to DNA. Okay, it's, uh, it's made up of nucleotides and uh, joined together in a long sequence. However, there are three significant differences. RNA has a base uracil instead of thymine. Okay, it has a sugar ribose instead of deoxyribose. And RNA is a single strand, whereas DNA is a double strand. So here's your RNA molecule here. Okay, it's obviously it's a single strand. And it has uracil, which are those pink bases, instead of thymine, which is blue over here. So there's no blue bases on this diagram. Now, one of the important types of RNA is called messenger RNA or mRNA. mRNA is almost an exact copy of DNA or sections of DNA. You can think of it as temporary copies that are used to carry instructions from the DNA in the nucleus out to, size, to the cytoplasm where the ribosomes are, and the ribosomes decode the messenger RNA and use it to make protein. So messenger RNA gets its code from DNA. It's a complementary copy or a matching copy of a section of DNA. 
messenger RNA carries instructions to make protein from the nucleus to ribosomes in the cell. Okay, we're going to look at DNA profiling or genetic fingerprinting. And this is what the syllabus says. The syllabus actually breaks it down very clearly to us what we need to learn. What's a DNA profile used for? It can be used to prove somebody was at a crime scene, for example, based on matching blood or tissue sample or hair. DNA profiling can be used to prove a family relationship, to prove if somebody is biologically related or to identify the biological parents of a child. DNA profiling could be used to identify um, the remains of people who, who have died. And DNA profiling could also be used to maybe identify illnesses or screen for disorders. So a DNA profile is a unique pattern of one person's DNA. And there are four steps you should know. Step one, cells need to be broken down in order to extract or release the DNA. The DNA is then cut into fragments. We use restriction enzymes for that. Restriction enzymes cut DNA at a particular point wherever they meet a particular base sequence. The fragments are separated by size and the pattern of fragments is analyzed compared to other samples of DNA. So in the picture, we're extracting the DNA, we're cutting the DNA with restriction enzymes, we're separating the fragments based on size. So in a diagram like this, the larger fragments would be at the bottom and the smaller fragments would be moved to the top. And then we just simply analyze the pattern. Now back to looking at how DNA replicates. So this is from the syllabus and involves the opening of the helix followed by the synthesis of complementary nucleic acid chains alongside the existing chains to form two identical helices. Now in the syllabus, nucleic acid, that's either DNA or RNA. Nucleic acid means DNA or RNA. Uh, two identical helices. Helices, this refers to the shape of the final molecule. Now you remember that mitosis produces exact copies of the number of chromosomes and the chromosomes in each for each daughter cell. DNA replication occurs when two exact copies of the DNA are made from one original strand. The DNA replication will happen before mitosis begins. So once mitosis has started, the DNA has already replicated. So quite simply in this, the DNA strand opens or unzips and two new strands are made from free nucleotides that are present in the nucleoplasm, the liquid inside the nucleus. So in the diagram, these would represent the free nucleotides. And over here, we can see that the existing, the old DNA strand has opened, exposing some uh, bases. And these free nucleotides will match in to the exposed bases. And that way, new strands are built up. And the enzyme responsible for this is called DNA polymerase. This is an example of an anabolic enzyme. You're building up a large molecule from smaller pieces. Now, if you're talking about genetic screening, remember genetic screening is testing for the presence of a particular gene. Okay, it could be a specific uh, gene that causes a disease. One example here just mentioned is a BRCA gene. Test is a test to detect changes in the DNA that may lead to an increased risk of breast cancer. So if you're positive for this genetic test, uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to get or develop breast cancer, but it might put you into a higher risk category. You may decide then to uh, change your lifestyle based on that information. Okay. And over here, we have some pros and cons, maybe looking at the ethics or the moral right or wrong of genetic screening. Okay. Um, so the pros, detecting defects that you could uh, repair. Okay, you, it gives you an opportunity to change your lifestyle to reduce the chance of a particular disease. The cons, maybe the 
the not so good side would be the danger of producing designer babies or selecting the type of children um, that would be born. Okay, so it's very hard to know what would be an acceptable uh, defect to be allowed. Now, looking on to protein synthesis, the uh, proteins are made from amino acids. The amino acids form chains called peptides. Longer chains form polypeptides. And these polypeptides must be folded into the final uh, shape of a protein. Okay, so this next part is going through the stages involved in protein synthesis. Okay, we're looking at the first stage is called transcription. Transcription occurs in the nucleus. That's when the DNA's code is copied to messenger RNA. So this is our DNA molecule. A copy of that is made to a molecule of RNA. The DNA remains inside the nucleus. A temporary copy of messenger RNA is made. Okay, messenger RNA will move out to the cytoplasm towards the ribosomes. In order to make this, the DNA molecule untwists where the gene is. A complementary sequence of bases built using an enzyme called RNA polymerase. So the DNA molecule partially unzips. A strip of RNA is made based on the open sequence of the DNA strand. Okay, now we're looking at translation. Translation is when the amino acid code, sorry, translation, start. Okay, now we're going to look at translation. Translation occurs when the messenger RNA is used to create a sequence of amino acids to form a protein. So the bit I've highlighted, messenger RNA code is used to put amino acids together in a particular sequence to form a peptide uh, or a small protein. A series of three bases is called a codon. Three bases together are referred to as a codon or a triplet. Now, the three bases on the messenger RNA can do one of three things. They can start the production of a protein. They can code for the addition of an amino acid. And then they can stop uh, the production of a protein. So you can be asked, what are the three different things that a codon can do? As each amino acid enters the cell after digestion, it's labeled with a small piece of RNA called transfer RNA. Okay, as the ribosome reads the messenger RNA code on amino acids with the complementary or the matching transfer RNA codons are attached uh, to the protein being produced. Sometimes this complementary transfer RNA is called an anticodon. So if we're looking at the diagram, this is the messenger RNA, and they are the little codons. Remember, this is uh, cytosine, uracil, uracil, uh, cytosine, adenine, cytosine, guanine, guanine, uracil. So the, each little tree bases is called a codon. The complement to those would be an anticodon. So GGU, the complement to GGU, would be an anticodon. CCA, which is attached to a particular um, amino acid, whatever G happens to stand for. So these letters here, H, G, R, and Y, are representing amino acids. And they've been built together uh, to form a sequence of amino acids. And there's a piece of transfer RNA that's now free to go off and attach to another amino acid. So quite a, a, it can be a difficult diagram to understand. Uh, the important, the key important thing is that translation is the way the messenger RNA code is used to put amino acids together in a particular sequence. Okay, we have the three things that a codon can do. It can start code for amino acid or stop the production of a protein. And what is transfer RNA? Transfer RNA is a short anticodon that's attached to an amino acid as soon as it enters the cell. Now we have a, a mandatory practical activity here to isolate DNA from plant tissue. 
So to summarize the steps, if we're going to use onion, chop the onion into very small pieces, that creates a large surface area that the detergent and salt can act on. Water, salt, and washing up liquid are added to the chopped onion. So the purpose of the detergent, the washing up liquid, is to dissolve away the cell membrane and the nuclear membrane. The salt helps to clump the DNA and will help it make it easier to separate later on. The mixture is then heated in a water bath at 60 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes. That temperature is sufficient to denature or destroy enzymes that would damage the DNA that we're trying to extract. Any longer than 15 minutes and the heat will begin to damage the DNA. Okay, so it's cooled the mixture in ice immediately after 15 minutes to prevent the breakdown of the DNA. Place the mixture in a blender for three seconds. This breaks up the cell walls and releases the DNA. So we give it a very short pulse in the blender. Any longer than that and we'll damage the DNA. Filter the mixture through coffee filter paper. The DNA is in solution. It's dissolved in the filtrate that passes through the filter paper. So we're going to filter it into a test tube. Add protease enzyme, a few drops of protease enzymes to the mixture to break down the protein that's binding the DNA together. So this loosens up the DNA. Add freezer cold alcohol, ice cold alcohol to the filtrate to bring DNA out of solution. So carefully dribble some alcohol down the side of the test tube. The alcohol will form a separate layer floating on top of the filtrate. The DNA can be seen as a, a type of it, a, a mucousy mixture or material floating just at the boundary layer between the alcohol and the filtrate. Okay, now I'm also going to look at this short little section on genetic engineering. So this is what the syllabus says, so it's just one line. Uh, genetic engineering is the manipulation alteration of genes. We must look at the process involving, and it tells us we have to learn isolation, transformation, and expression. And we have to learn three applications, one from a plant, one from an animal, one from a microorganism. So in this case, the syllabus is spelling out what we need to learn. So a, def a definition for genetic engineering is the deliberate changing or manipulation of an organism's DNA. So we're not just uh, doing a breeding program, we're actually scientific in, in a laboratory, we're getting in and we're changing, deliberately manipulating an organism's DNA. Okay, um, the three applications, it can be used to produce bacteria, to produce human insulin, and we'll examine that in a bit of detail in the next slide. Genetic engineering can be used to produce long life or frost resisting tomatoes, wheat killer resistant crops, or rice that is high in vitamin A. So in the pictures here, I have human insulin, which is actually manufactured by bacteria, genetically modified bacteria. It's a picture of rice that's been genetically modified to be high in vitamin A. Okay, and we have a picture of a sheep that has been genetically modified to produce a medicine. So this sheep produces a medicine to help treat people with uh, a lung disease. Okay, so uh, using farm animals like that to produce medicines is known as farming, where it's spelled P-H-A-R-M-I-N-G. Now we're looking at the main steps. This is the last slide. We're looking at the main steps in genetic engineering, which we're breaking it down into three steps, isolation, transformation, and expression. In isolation, we're cutting or isolating the the DNA or the gene from a donor cell, could it be a human cell? Okay, so we're taking out the human insulin gene and we're also isolating a plasmid from a bacteria. We're going to use a small little loops of DNA called plasmids from bacteria because they're very easy to manipulate and they readily absorb uh, spliced DNA. So cut both the gene of interest and the plasmid with the same restriction enzymes. Okay, so in the diagram here, we're using restriction enzymes to um, insert a human insulin gene. Okay, there's the, the red human insulin gene. We're going to attach it to a bacteria plasmid. 
Okay, so the first step, isolation, is about cutting out the gene of interest and cutting out the plasmid. Transformation attached the gene into the bacterial plasmid with an enzyme called ligase. Ligase enzyme will attach the human insulin gene onto the plasmid. Allow the genetically transformed bacteria to reproduce and make copies of the inserted gene. Okay, so the gene is attached into the plasmid. The plasmid is absorbed back into a bacteria and the bacteria are allowed to reproduce. And finally, expression, the cloned cells, so at this stage, the bacteria have made many copies of themselves. The cloned cells follow the instructions that are on the inserted human gene to produce uh, the protein. In this case, it could be human insulin. 